Great. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us in the interest of uh, time and being strategically scheduled before many uh, an important match today. Um, we are going to uh, get started and, and hopefully uh, keep to time uh, for all of us. Uh, I'm Nicole Golden. I'm the director of the Youth Prosperity and Security Initiative here at CSIS, uh, which we launched a year and a half ago in partnership with the International Youth Foundation. And I am very delighted to be joined today um, by our three very uh, distinguished guests. Uh, we have Paul Peeple, who is the director of Aganar and, and Sports for Development at Partners for the Americas. You have their fuller lengthy impressive bios on stage. Of course, uh, to his right, we have Brianna Scurry. We're delighted to have with us. Two-time uh, gold medal Olympic champion, World Cup champion, um, among other impressive uh, talents, and is also currently a sports envoy with the US Department of State, which we'll hear more about, I'm sure. And to her right, we have uh, delighted to have my friend Awista Ayu, who is the director of South Asia programs at Seeds of Peace, and also the author, which she'll tell us more about, of her experiences in the Kabul Girls Soccer Club. Um, like many of you, I don't know how uh, our guests had to drink several cups of tea last night in order to get my voice back intact. Uh, for, for today's session, um, but I'm, I'm very glad that you're all here um, to talk about the serious side of, of youth and soccer. Um, you know, we're having this conversation today amidst uh, the World Cup, of course. Um, if you weren't aware, it's also Olympic Day, uh, June 23rd, so keep that in mind. Um, but, uh, you know, all, more seriously, we're also having this event amidst the global youth unemployment uh, crisis or challenge, if, depending on how you look at it. Um, you know, recurring and flaring conflict and crises around the world, um, and really seeing the, the rise of, of soccer um, and sport more generally as a platform, as a tool in, in diplomacy and promoting peace, and importantly in sort of youth development and skills, and skills generation. So those are some of the things we're, we're hoping to scratch the surface of. As always, we'll probably ask more questions than we'll answer. Um, but with that, let's, let's um, kick it off. And um, I'm going to ask the three of you the same question. And I, I assume we're probably going to hear three slightly different answers, um, which is, why should we think seriously about youth and soccer? Paul, I'm going to give them to you first. OK, great. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And thank you all for being here today. Um, why should we think about youth and soccer? It's passion. And young people are passionate and want to be passionate about what they do and what they learn. Um, there are so many good things that we can learn from soccer. And let's just take last night's game. As disappointed as it was for many of us, the US suffered a terrible lapse in concentration, which led to a goal. We need to learn for us, which Aganar is, a, as we like to say, is a youth employment program wrapped inside of a soccer ball. We focus on youth employment, and we use the lessons of soccer to help young people learn the job skills that they need, both the, the life skills, employability skills, and the hard skills that they need to get a job from lessons from the field in both interactive activities and classroom activities. So you have to concentrate in what you do. You have to dig deep within yourself and find a way to come back. You have to play the full 90 or 95 minutes. You can't take off a minute before the, before the, the horn blows or the whistle blows. And you have to be ready for that one moment when the light shines on you that you have to, you have to step up. And she knows better than I do. She's the <laughs> expert about stepping up on the greatest stage in the world. But these are things that young people, uh, we have a tremendous dropout program, a dropout problem in Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, I was looking at some statistics in, in Guatemala and in Honduras, if you look at the 20, uh, the poorest 20% of the population, less than 10% of those people finish, of young people finish high school. And 40% say that they drop out because they're bored, because they don't find school worthwhile or interesting. So we need to make education interesting. And what's more interesting than soccer? What's brought us all here today? What got us all dressed in our national colors for the last two weeks? It's our love of soccer and these things that unite us. And so what I think we can do is use soccer as this uniting force and build on this excitement. But then once we peel it back, we can see that there are many, many, many lessons 
that from playing soccer, from just trying soccer, a young girl for the first time who learns to, to receive a ball and to make a pass, what that means in her life and what that gives her the confidence to do in the rest of her life. There's just so many things that we can build on um, that make it relevant for us. That's great, and a great segue to a list. I'm going to come to you next. Um, tell us why we should think seriously about youth in soccer. Sure, and I'll answer that um, question just kind of giving the brief history of women's soccer um, in Afghanistan, something that I saw from um, not existing 10 years ago to being a very strong program today. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I started a, a girls' soccer program about 10 years ago for a group of Afghan girls, actually 10 years ago this month. Um, I brought a girls' soccer team from Kabul to the States, and it was an idea that I actually um, thought of many years before that, um, being an Afghan national, wanting to contribute back to a homeland that I loved so much. And I grew up watching um, Brianna and Julie Foudy and Mia Hamm win many World Cups um, and many gold medals. Um, and much to their credit and much to the uh, support of Title IX, for me, soccer as an American, Afghan-American girl was very much viewed as a gender-neutral sport within my mindset. To see a girl playing soccer, for me, um, was no different than seeing a boy playing soccer. And I think a sport like ice hockey, something that I did play is very different. And I couldn't say that for, for ice hockey, for example. And so when starting this team, I was very naive. I had a very American mindset. Didn't really understand the culture and the context of what soccer meant for a young girl in Afghanistan to play. And when I was recruiting girls for this first camp that I was holding, I couldn't find girls in Kabul who were playing soccer. And I really didn't question it. I was 23, 24 at the time, very, naive and very idealistic, and I really didn't understand um, at that time why I couldn't find these girls. So the girls came here, they were trained, they went back, and it wasn't until they went home that I really understood what I had done. And I naively ended up putting these young girls in a position of power, but also vulnerability, because they were the only girls who were playing soccer in Afghanistan at that time, not because there was no youth soccer program after 30 years of war, which is what I attributed that to, but because girls just didn't play soccer. And what I thought of as being a very gender neutral sport with my American context was far from the case. In the case of Afghanistan and many other countries since then that I've worked in, whether it was Morocco or India, um, Pakistan as well. And it was really then that I understood the politics that soccer entails. And I think it's important to understand that, that idea. I think as an American, we take for granted sometimes that we've had world championship women's teams that really have broken that stereotype and we don't think twice about what it means to be a girl playing a sport, but in a country like Afghanistan, it means a lot. And so when these girls went back, they were really up against um, men even, who were sometimes three times their age, who had never seen a girl kick a ball, and they were finally speaking up against it, not because um, they wanted to, to really push the gender norms for any reason because other than the fact that they love the sport, that they came to really understand and feel passionate about. And so they ended up really igniting these conversations off the pitch too. It wasn't just about the right to play soccer, but what it meant in the context of Afghanistan when women's rights were so uh, hampered for the past uh, 20 years before that date. And so I think soccer and sports in general, when it comes to a country like that, says a lot about what it means for these girls to push that barrier. And just to give you some ideas of what issues they were struggling against um, and the expectations that were put on them, but I think soccer really ended up having them challenge some things when it came to their private life and their public life. What it means to be a young girl at home who's responsible for errands and what it means to be a girl who would rather not do those errands and play soccer for an hour. Um, and a lot of times there were battles at home really between parents and brothers and between siblings, whether it was another girl too, who really couldn't understand and value why their sister um, wanted to play soccer within this family. Um, the question of marriage, you know, marriage is still very much um, at a young age for these young girls. And so the Federation, even when I was in Kabul, um, told me, you know, why should we invest in these girls when by the time they turn 18 or 20, they'll get married. And we've just spent four years investing time, energy, and resources to them rather than on the men's team. And so that was certainly something that they're up against all the time. Um, again, length of, that leads to length of access to the sport. Um, and travel, you know, when these girls started traveling around the world later on, like what it meant for them to be a young girl, a single girl, who was traveling with a team, even if it was other young girls, what it meant to travel away from your family. Um, and lastly, you know, what was interesting is um, gender roles when it came to sexuality. Um, I remember one time in Morocco being in a, a meeting with a coach, and he actually was um, quoting back scriptures of the Quran because 
there was rumors that girls who were playing sports and specifically soccer were considered lesbians within this community. And so this coach was really nervous about what um, that meant for this team that he was representing, but also that the girls are representing. And I found that to be very fascinating. I certainly understand the context of why he was doing that. I, I might not agree with it necessarily, but um, as a Muslim also, I really understood what that meant to, uh, in a culture that's so conservative to have these questions of sexuality come up. Um, and I'll just leave you with a few um, points um, and then we could certainly move on. But I think what ended up happening with these girls was pretty phenomenal for a number of reasons. And it wasn't just these young girls alone that were really carrying that torch. But this program that started 10 years ago when no girls were playing soccer has now grown into a national um, football team that the Federation supports because they finally understood the value of having these girls play. FIFA certainly also played a role by mandating that a women's team be formed in any country that now is FIFA supported, similar to our Title IX mandate. Um, but I also saw Statistan and these other programs for young girls, whether it's cricket, um, just really blossom in the past five, six years alone. So I think these girls, I think it's safe to say, really ended up spearheading um, this effort. And I'll just leave um, a few, I think, points um, in terms of just what I think helped become a driver for that. And I think part of it is advocacy. I think whether it was the girls or other officials and adults who really became advocates for them. I think awareness really also was a big driving force to make that social shift happen. Success, certainly, once the girls were becoming successful, whether it was nationally or internationally, I think then men and others in the community were able to finally justify why there was a soccer team or any sports team. Um, access, whether it was the lack of access in the beginning and then increased access as a result of that success also became a major driving point to help this sport or other sports stick. And lastly, funding. You know, FIFA did and does still support the women's team through their own funding and or in order to really help promote sports um, for young girls in Afghanistan and to promote soccer. And so I think all these driving factors combined really helped make this initiative that I started as a very naive, you know, 23-year-old uh, into something that really shaped um, the landscape for women's sports like 10 years later in Afghanistan at least. So thank you. So lots to come back to already between Paul and Arista, but before that, Brianna. So we've heard about the skills piece, we've heard about you know the the promoting rights awareness within the self, within the community as a player, both right. you know, growing up here in the US and as I said, competing globally. What are your thoughts on why should we be taking this seriously? Well, my answer is in two parts. Let me first address the part about youth and soccer. The, the one thing that's common of the sport of soccer that is uncommon with most other sport is the countries other than the US, it's part of their culture. It's part of the fabric of that country, whether it's the boys that are playing and girls aren't playing or both are playing. Um, you can go to Guatemala and you see soccer played there. You go to Brazil, you see soccer played there. You go to Europe, there's somebody playing soccer. That, that's part of the culture. The sport of soccer is part of the culture internationally. And we're actually, US, are a bit late to the party. So we're running as fast as we can to literally catch up with the skill level of every other country. And that's why the sport of soccer is so great as a, as a symbol and as, a, as a, um, an introduction because the, our country and the, all these other countries have that in common. We have an understanding of the game of soccer. Therefore, we have somewhat of an understanding with each other. That's where the common ground is. So when you go to other countries that may not have had baseball before, you have to teach them baseball. Go to other countries that didn't have American football, you have to teach them American football. Whereas in soccer, you go over there, we can all kick around whether we're from Russia or from you know, Argentina or Canada and all have an understanding of each other without even knowing each other. So that's the beauty of, of soccer um, in the international community and in the US. Um, in terms of the spread and, and who's playing and, and, and who's not, and in Afghanistan in particular, um, being someone who started with the women's national team when I was 23, um, played in the 1995 Women's World Cup. I didn't know, as someone who was growing up in soccer, playing in high school and college, that there was even a women's national team. And I was in the sport. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find out that there was a women's national team, that there was a Women's World Cup until 1993, two years after it had occurred. I mean, Michelle Akers, Julie Foudy, Mia Hamm, all played and won the 1991 Women's World Cup in China. And I, being someone in the sport, at a high level, close to possibly being able to make the national team, had no idea. No idea. So 
Michelle Akers tells a great story. She said, you know, we went over to, to China and played in the Women's World Cup and won, and the only person that greeted us when we got back to the airport was the equipment manager to come pick up the gear. You know, I mean, the Federation didn't really acknowledge it because they were so focused on the men's side. And just the response of the community and society of the US had no idea that these women had done this amazing thing. And then 1995, Women's World Cup, it was a little bit better, you know, a little bit more visible. We were playing in Sweden and we ended up getting third, unfortunately, that time. A few more people started to notice. And then the 1996 Olympic Games, women's soccer, the first time women's soccer was uh, in, in the Olympics, we went full medal the first time. Usually there's a, a period where there's an experimental period and then the next Olympic Games, you're, you're full medal. We went full medal and played in front of 76,000 people at, um, in Athens, Georgia. That's when you know, people started to sit up and take notice, but as a women's national team, we had to fight for two massage therapists. We had to fight for you know, childcare. I mean, because we are, you know, the, the, the athletes and the women that are having the children that are, you know, expected to have one type of societal role to having to fight and let the Federation know and everybody else know that, yes, we can play a sport professionally and still be moms and do both well. And so Joy Fawcett, Carla Overbeck were two of the very first higher visible women that played a professional sport and you know, had children at the same time and brought their kids to Portugal and you know, Italy and Canada and Asia and were mothers on the pitch and off the pitch. And so we had to fight. And I think everything that is great, that becomes something bigger, and everybody understands that it's more important than just them, you have to claw and you have to fight for these things. And you see the end product, like the 1999 World Cup, Rose Bowl, 90,000 people, holy cow, this is amazing. That took a lot of work leading up to that point. It took people deciding to get in there you know, and make a difference and change something in order to get to that point. And so that's, that's the beauty of soccer, but our women's national team who had already won a World Cup, we had to fight as well. But coming back to that, I mean, like you said, it's about the fight and it's also about, you know, the individual. I mean, to what Paul was saying about some of those skills that you gain growing up. So I'm gonna stay with you for a second, Brianna, reflecting back to when you're in growing up as a you know, player, whether it's, in, you know, I'm sure from the time you were small, but in, you know, as you got into sort of high school and even beyond, how did sort of playing the sport, how do you think it affected whether it's your, you know, your work in school or your ability to then kind of be on this international stage and be successful on the pitch as well as off? Right, well for me, I always gravitated towards the team sports when I was younger. I didn't start playing soccer until I was 12, which is like way late for a lot of the kids nowadays. And my family didn't have a lot of money, so I knew that if, in order to even go to college eventually, I was gonna have to earn a scholarship. And fortunately, I was gifted athletically because of my parents, and they were also incredibly supportive. And the things that I learned playing soccer, I mean, teamwork, commitment, leadership, these are all things that have been woven into me and I've learned and become part of me through the sport of soccer, but they also become a part of someone that plays basketball as well. But I think the key thing for me was I was given an opportunity. I was giving, given a chance and a choice to play a sport and express myself that way. And that wouldn't have happened necessarily without other people coming before me and saying, you know what, this is important for young girls to have this opportunity, and I was grateful to be able to have it. Paul, in work throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, and I'm sure many of the participants in your programs, you know, similar to the Afghanistan or other South Asia contexts, are facing adversity in one way or another. How do you get them engaged? What are some of the particular challenges that you face in not only bringing both girls and boys into the program, but keeping them there, having them be successful sort of in the long run, and then implementing the program in general. What are some of those sort of risks you see? Well, it's a couple of interesting things. When we started this program nine years ago, one of the things people said, well, what about girls? Girls don't play soccer. What about girls? And we said, just 
give, just give us a chance, girls will show up. Because we knew from our own experience here that girls just wanted an opportunity to play. And if you, so one of the things you need to do is make sure you have a safe space and that girls know that they're welcome within your program. For us though, what we found out over time was that it wasn't really soccer that what brought people to our program. It was because they wanted a job and they thought, I can get a job, through a, go through a job training program and get to play soccer. This is pretty cool. I, I didn't do so well in school. I didn't like school, but I think I can stick with this. And so there was a hook related, but the hook is also the job. And, and I think that's important for us to remember. The things that, that make it tough as we go through, we work in some of the most violent communities in the world. Uh, we work in some dangerous communities in San Pedro Sula, Honduras, which is the most violent city in the world right now, and that's not in a war zone. And so young people have to walk different paths every day to get to class. Uh, they need to pair up in, in twos and threes and fours. Young girls face a lot of, you know, they have to walk through a gauntlet of comments and they have to convince their parents that that if they're gonna be in a soccer program, they're not gonna become a lesbian, that they're, it's just, you know, a lot of things, a lot of things that they go through. And then when they play, they get, some of the boys aren't so kind to them at first. And so we have to work on having this safe environment and having strong women in the program who show the way and work with the young men to also demonstrate respect back to the girls. And what we found a part of that is that, you know, we, there's a real deficit in opportunities for girls, but young boys who are the people in Latin America who are killing themselves at the highest rate really need to learn from girls and really need this practice. And so we play a game where you have to hold hands with your teammate. Mm -hmm. And just think of all of the implications of a boy and a girl holding hands and the snickering that can go on for a thousand different reasons. And and so, but what does it mean? They learn, they learn. And sometimes the girl is better and it really shows up the guy and that really upsets him. And it's just, it, it's great, it's great. <laughs> uh, but, um, <clears throat> or sometimes the guy won't pass the ball to the girl and somebody says, hey, you know, she's your teammate. Why aren't you, why aren't you being respectful to her? Or she's afraid of the ball. And what she learns over time is that, oh, I touched it, I completed a pass. And that becomes a metaphor for something bigger that she can do in life. And so um, there's the violence in Latin America is so extreme now that I think that's still our, our big challenge. And, and young people who just, they're dealing with violence in the homes and violence in the communities and they cross gang lines to, to get there. But what I think we need to remember is that in spite of this, in spite of all the bad things that people say, about young people. There are tremendous young people out there and, and tremendous young people who dropped out of school in the second and fourth and eighth grade and tremendous young people who have suffered all sorts of hell. And they're smart, their academic achievement is not an indication of their, of their intelligence and they, you know, they, they just want a chance. And when you give them a ball and you give them a chance, they can, they need to learn themselves. They have to be able to understand that they have hope and that they can aspire for something else. I talked to someone last week about the immigration crisis now and the young people come to the United States and he said that, that one of the big problems with this crisis and the gang problem is that young people do not believe that they can hope, that they do not see that there's a better future. So we have to use soccer to do this and scoring a goal is like, you can do this, what else can we do? You talked about scoring a goal, and it made me start thinking a little bit about, you know, where what is a success in soccer programs? Because with, what I'm hearing is it's not only about what um, the young men, young women, girls and boys get out of it themselves, but for, say, a, a community in, in Afghanistan or one of the other countries you're working in, what does it mean from a community perspective and how do we, how are we and how should we be measuring success? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Afghanistan is so early on uh, in the phase of sports and development. So I think success really is just about numbers rather than it is about any kind of championship one. Um, I think the U.S. is very different. We, you know, that's how we measure success. Um, 
but I think it's really about uh, just getting the numbers up there. I think uh, you know Paul talked about some of the issues that he faced with getting girls on the pitch, and you know in Afghanistan it, it really oftentimes is just having conversations door to door with parents and really getting the permission um, for their daughters to play. And so I think numbers, whenever I, I've talked about success, it's always come down to that. You know, and I know that's always not always the the best and safest metric matrix yeah. um, or measurement of success, but I think that's what it really is um, there. And I think to be able to say that there's so many federations now that have started women's programs, I think is also a benchmark of success and a positive number that you can give out that really demonstrates where the country is today versus where it was 10 years ago when no federation or, or maybe two federations had a women's program to now have over 20. I think that, that number is success. Yeah. Yeah. Paul, success is what, getting a job? Getting a job. Getting a job. Getting a job. And so for us, our latest uh, analysis that about 75% of our graduates were getting jobs within a year or going back to school. And we, so for us, scoring the goal is getting a job, going back to school, or starting your own business. Brianna, when you think about the work that you're doing now, um, what does success to you look like in terms of young people and their role, in their own sort of role in themselves and in their communities and societies? I think originally for me, success meant you know, if I can make the save, if we can win the game, if we can win the championship. But it wasn't until five, 10, 15 years after the Olympics in 96, after the Women's World Cup in 99, that I realized success meant something completely different, that it meant, in fact, you know, inspiration. So many parents and players that were 11, 12, 13 years old when we had the World Cup who were inspired by what we were doing and went on to create amazing programs or be a part of soccer program or teach their kid how to play or were just like touched somewhere in their bodies and their souls by what we were doing and all we were doing was just trying to win the game. You know, and so for me, the measurement of success is how the sport exponentially grew after our success on the pitch grew off the pitch. And like you said, all of a sudden, federations that, two federations that had a women's program, now it's 20. And I believe that there's a direct correlation with our team success and showing that we could put people in the seats and watch a women's only event. And we could seat 78,000 and 67,000 and 77,000 at these tournaments. And that showed people, okay, that may have taken a lot of work for the US to do, but they did do it. Yeah. You know, at the very least, let's try. You know, let's try to like, give girls a chance. Let's, let's open ourselves up to giving them that opportunity, not expecting necessarily for them to play for their country, but giving them a chance, giving them a choice. And that, to me, is success. So on that note, what's I mean, what's getting in the way? And I ask that, you know, we're here sort of, you know, in the room, clearly the interested parties. We're here at CSIS, the development, foreign policy, obviously think tank, national security. And in the global development, you know, and, and even arguably diplomacy context, I mean, sports is to a certain degree, um, uh, you know, a, a cute thing, a nice thing, an add-on, right? What is getting in the way of really scaling of, of these kinds of programs um, and this kind of work. I mean, you mentioned, you know, Alyssa, in your opening comments, what you saw as being required for success. And is it funding? Is it political will? Um, is it, you know, the right environment? Is it the right partnerships with the private sector? I mean, as you're sort of out there um, thinking about how to do more of this, what's What's getting in the way? And is it, do we not know enough about what's working and how to, and, and how to do that? Alyssa, yes. come to you first. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I, I'd love to hear Paul's answer to your <laughs> light of mine. Um, I think I've struggled with the idea of scaling as being, especially when it comes to development, as being the only benchmark um, for things, a program is successful, because I don't think scaling is always the solution. Um, I think what I've seen in the sports and development realm over the past 10 years since I first got involved with someone who is very out, outside of that, that sphere um, is that I think it's become a very mainstream type of activity to add on to things. And I think there are those like, you know, like what Paul's doing certainly it makes sense, but I've seen just organizations that have no sports focus at it because USAID now is supporting it. And so 
I think I'm nervous about saying scaling, scaling is yeah. really any yeah. kind of success within, this, within our field. Um, and I would say maybe sometimes what's holding it back is because so many people are doing it that it's somewhat been watered down. So those who really are the experts and really know what they're doing, like Paul's organization that has 10 years worth of a history underneath uh, their belts are not the ones who maybe have the access to the right, that funding, and I know you do, um, but maybe they don't have the right access to the funding who are, I don't wanna say worthy, but who have really demonstrated the impact of their work. And so I think there are organizations that are receiving large amounts of funding who haven't demonstrated that impact. And I think for me, demonstrating impact is more important than scaling. So I know that's a very <laughs> loaded uh, response, but I'd love to hear both your perspectives on that. Paul, um, you up to go okay, I think I'll focus <laughs> on two <laughs> things. <laughs> well, one of the things for when you look at scale versus quality, the quality I think of all of our programs comes down to the quality of the facilitator or the coach. And so how we find the ability to scale has to come from investing and in training, supervising, guiding, and accompanying those great teachers, facilitators. The, those are, they're the real heroes in our program. They're the ones who go into the community in Ciudad Juarez and in Guatemala City and the favelas in Rio. And um, you know, I get to come to nice things like this. But uh, those people are amazing. So how do we, basically, how do we replicate those people and how do we pay them? Because they're not, they can't live off of good intentions either. And so that's one thing. The other is, and so I think we need funding to scale those people, to train them. Um, and then the other part is we need more evidence. And uh, it's, a, it's a really important thing that IDB and USAID and State Department through Sports United all have offices dedicated to sport for development. And uh, other institutions are taking it very seriously. But the evidence, and so we're working with USAID right now on an impact evaluation in Guatemala and Honduras to try to look at it and say, what are the secret elements, what's the value added of sport within our model versus a very similar uh, youth employment training program? It's really hard to do that, but a lot of people are very interested in what the results are, and it's gonna take a while for us to get to those results. But our hope is that once we get to that, we're gonna be able to say to people, this is the value added. And even if it's 10% or 15%, that's 10 or 15% on the lowest level investment you can ever have. A soccer ball and a piece, it doesn't even have to be a piece of grass, it's a piece of dirt, rocks, you know, where young people play. And a lot of times we get the balls donated. So it, these are low, the, the real investment needs to go back to those teachers and, and providing maybe a snack for the young people. But we need that evidence and for people, I like to talk about the magic of sport, but I need to be able to, to give numbers instead of talking about magic. Brianna, what's on your front? I think um, what is important to remember is when you're a trailblazer, you're naturally gonna have more friction to go against compared to anybody that comes behind you. So I think what we're seeing right now is, honestly, the trail is now being blazed by different organizations who began 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And if you look at the history of a movement, for example, these things take decades sometimes to become what they are. For example, the NFL right now, there was a time in the 60s and the 70s where you know, it was a, a, a hobby or, or <coughs> you know, just a, something to do and watch. And now it's like the huge juggernaut business and it's bringing in billions of dollars in TV and you know, um, fans and revenue and all that. And that took time and, and, and so will this. However, there are people that care and people that are willing to share stories and do the work and roll up the sleeves and start hacking away and blaze those trails for other people to come behind. And naturally, you're gonna have some people that come behind that aren't gonna be as successful, but at least with those individuals and those organizations, you see what does and doesn't work. And maybe they had an element to their program that was good in one way and, and a different element that wasn't. So the one that comes behind there adopts the one that worked and alters the one that didn't. And then before you know it, you have 
several different organizations and, and, and companies wanting to invest and funding and people are making change and changing, literally changing the world one, one person at a time and giving the youth of this whole world an opportunity to let me kick the soccer ball around instead of you know, doing something else over here that might be a detriment to that child. Like just being able to have more than one choice on the table for me really is, is a huge difference. I am up here now today even playing on the national team because of after school activities that were available to me when I was 12. If those activities weren't there, I wouldn't be here. And it was literally a piece of paper and an opportunity that was given to me that I took hold of and ran like crazy with it. And you'll be surprised in the 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you'll hear stories of the kids that you guys helped that ended up being so much more than they thought they could be because of it. That's amazing. And you know, before I come um, to, to you all for your questions, so start getting them in your head, um, you know, Brianna, you mentioned talking about what works and what doesn't. And I think in, in the development context, we're often um, very leery of talking about where um, something didn't work out so well or talking about what didn't work. So before we go to the audience, is there, you know, Paul and, and Arista, is there any particular, Brianna, if you have any additional thoughts, you know, something specific, you know, that is, um, to, you know, to be aware of, something that didn't work that we sort of learned from, you know, again, we want our young people to learn from uh, mistakes, right, as we go forward. Is there any, you know, particular thing that in doing this work that we can take away as what didn't work or what to do better? Um, there's so many. It's hard to narrow it down. I'm going to look over at my <laughs> colleagues because they're like, well, why didn't you say this? Why didn't you say that? Um, one of the things we're struggling with right now is we've got, uh, uh, we got a couple of, most of our programs are after school programs or uh, you come into it voluntarily. And we're working now with some programs in schools. And so one of the things that is a, a challenge is that there's a difference between the profile of the young person who has been told by their teachers they need to go into the Aganar program versus the young person who says, I want to go into the Aganar program. And we're needing, we're trying to figure out how to motivate those young people who've, more, who've been assigned to us mm -hmm. in the ways that the young people who've come to us voluntarily are motivated. And that's a, a little bit of a struggle right now for us. Interesting. Okay. I mean, I this is a hard question for me to answer because I did make a very naive decision 10 years ago, but I would say, you know, it's, I think, standard for any development program, whether it's sports or non-sports, to just really understand the context of what you're doing. Um, I mean, fortunately, 10 years later, I can say that it, it became a successful program through a very, um, through, you know, through, I think, a lot of different factors that just happened to coalesce, but I didn't know that it would be as successful as it became locally, um, even without my, my hand in it. So I think just understand the context. And, and to be honest, had I known that soccer was so gendered um, as a sport, I don't know if I would have chosen it You know, 10 years ago. I probably would have been safer and picked basketball or volleyball, which were historically female sports. So by default, I ended up really like changing the status quo and, and really put these girls in a position where they were changing it. But I would say just understand the context. And sometimes it's not, it might not work out in this way. Um, and maybe there are different avenues too that are, are safer and maybe more sustainable too. Brianna, any particular sort of words of caution, so to speak, from either your own personal experience or sort of what you've seen, what you do now in thinking about youth in the, uh, soccer programming? I, I honestly consider myself someone who sees the glass half full. I mean, as a goalkeeper, you're going to get scored on. It happens, right? So that's considered a bad thing mm -hmm. as a goalkeeper, but hey, guess what, it's gonna happen. So you take the good with the bad. You take the things that didn't seem to quite work out and you learn from it. And I think part of the thing that I've noticed that people tend to lose as they become adults is understanding that the mistakes are actually part of how you learn. And that's part of the path as well. And the mistakes are just as important as the successes. And so now with the, with the two of you, starting these programs, like I said earlier, you are showing people, okay, I did this and this with my group, and you know, the next person will come behind and say, okay, I wanna take that on. 
And I, I think it's amazing that you chose soccer. I know it was probably incredibly dangerous for those girls, but I mean, they are, they are heroes. And they may not understand that now, but someday they will. Mm -hmm. And people who come behind, and other girls now probably feel, hey, me too. Mm -hmm. And just if you're able to change that mentality of a young child, you're, you're already halfway there. Hey, me too. And that's all it takes, really. Well, hey, me too. I'm sure some of you have hey, me too questions. <laughs> um, but before we do, I did, I did mention that today is Olympic Day. Um, and, and Paul mentioned the work of IDB, and we're very lucky to have our uh, friend, uh, Frederick Iglesias, with us um, today. He is a, a Bolivian Olympian um, and um, currently also working at the IDB, leading many of their sports for development and programs. So I'm going to ask him for his sort of initial kind of, uh, you know, few comments on what he's heard, and, and if you get to ask the first question as a, as a fellow Olympian in the room. <laughs> we got a mic for you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invite and for this wonderful panel. Um, I just want to comment a few things. Uh, Brianna uh, make a good point on her experience uh, educating people in, in, in the U.S. Uh, since soccer is not, was not a big uh, sport, now it seems like it is. Um, in, in some countries in Latin America, like, like Bolivia or El Salvador, we have the, the opposite uh, experience. In, in my case, um, for example, I, I ran 800 meters, and uh, every four years during the Olympics, everybody has high expectations, and Bolivia or El Salvador never got a medal in the history of, of of both countries and several other countries in Latin America, Ecuador just got one, whole, the, the whole history. So um, we have different problems, um, talking as myself. Talking as, as, as the IDB, we, we just closed, um, we just finished a, a project in, in, in Bolivia, in El Alto, um, for uh, gender equality. Um, and one of the components that we, we had in, in that project was uh, the education in, in self-esteem. I think it's, it's, a, it's a big step because if, I mean, if, if you don't believe in yourself as a person, it's difficult to, to, to reach the different levels. So when, 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 you, when you ask about the measure of success, um, I mean, we all have a common language today, but it's a good point that you raise on the table. Um, at the ADB, we, we we consider monitoring and evaluation from the inception of our our programs. I'm sure you you you, you consider the same, but it's important to 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 measure that success. Uh, in this particular case, in in, in Alto Bolivia, um, we we would like to increase the the, the participation of people in their communities, and uh, maybe someday uh, as policymakers. M my last comment. Uh, we interviewed the the, um, the forward of the national team, female team in Bolivia, uh, a person like like you, a, a national hero, and and she said that among the 20, uh, 20 clubs, female clubs, there was just one only uh, female head coach. Mm. This is something that w that we need to change eventually. Thank you. Thanks so much. I mean, the point about coaching, I think, is an interesting one. Uh, Brianna, do you have any sort of thoughts on that? And then we'll take a few more questions. Yeah, we, we as a national team, we've had male and female coaches. And, you know, we were, we, Anson Dorrance was the original head coach of our team. And then, you know, we had April Heinrichs. And then we went to Greg Ryan. And now it's, you know, Tom Tremonti. And now it's back to Jill Ellis. So we've gone back and forth with that. But I think, I think females at positions of command and power, as coaches, as CEOs, as you know, running major organizations, it's it's all changing, you know. And I think once again, those things take time. But somebody's got to be first. And sometimes it, that friction of of being the first or the second or the third takes time. And it's time now to, you know, accelerate. Hopefully that change and it would be nice to see more women's head coaches either in the national team arena or in the club higher you know level club team level as well but you know I, I would say in the next 10 years you'll probably see a female head coach at some 
major you know, club in the, in the world at some point. Paul, just quickly back to you on this one, because you made the, in the interesting, I think, good analogy about, you know, between the importance, what we know of the, the importance and the role of teachers in education quality. Um, where, you know, how do, do you have trouble finding sort of the right mix of coaches? Is there, what is the coaching sort of gap, if you will, or is there one? And, in this context, in your context? Well, we're, we look for people to, we have a manual that we follow. It's a 100 hour course that focuses on teamwork, communication, discipline, respect, a focus on results and continual self-improvement. And it's a mixture of classroom and field activities. And so in some programs, depending on the size of the program, we have people dedicated to field activities and, and others dedicated to classroom. But in the small programs, it's one person who does it all. We struggled with saying, oh, well, some people say, well, we gotta find soccer coaches. We gotta find people who are certified PE teachers. And we found out that those folks were not always the best ones because a soccer coach is kind of trained to be a soccer coach. And to oftentimes, you know, their reward is a trophy. And for us, the reward is that self-esteem, that person stepping up and recognizing that they've got something, they're different. And, you know, and it's sort of the, the person who was in the worst shape on day one, if you know this young boy or young girl who raises their head to ask a question after three or six weeks, that's a that's a golazo, you know. Yeah. And so we want people who do that. So we've been trying. We found success finding people with social work background, with adult education background, hiring people who come from the same communities to relate to them. And, and what we found, like in Ciudad Juarez, a couple of cases where people just have terrible stories, backstories, and it's holding them back. And it's that facilitator from that community who works with them, who works with them, and this is the magic of the ball that makes them connect. And eventually that young person feels the, as we say in Spanish, the confianza to, to say what it is that's holding them back. And now they're opening it up and they can sort of start dealing with the problems and this young person can then start to blossom. But it's, it's that. And we have a, a lot of training and, and, and then facilitators need to know that, you know, just like a great coach, maybe your coach can push you in one way but can't push me a ham in the same way mm -hmm. because you're different people and you respond differently. And those facilitators need to understand what's going on. Or maybe this girl came to class today and I have a good, you know, the fact that she's here and a few minutes late, there's, there, she had to go through hell last night at home. And so I need to, in the way I work with her, or this young boy who's so angry, I have to, I'm not going to call him out. It's a mistake. I did, made a mistake calling out a young boy because I, without knowing him. And, um, and the good facilitators need to know the stories of everybody so they can really motivate them. In the, in the Muslim context, Alyssa, is this, was this an issue in sort of, not, again, not only getting the participants, but the coaches and the, the, the yeah. right facilitators? Sure, I mean, I think um, there's still very few female coaches, and so just as an example, um, the national team in Afghanistan, the first national team, is, was run by a male coach because he was a net former national team player who knows the sport very well, and so was the best position to coach a national team, and that did cause issues at, at home with the girls sometimes when the parents are very reluctant to send their daughter to the pitch. And so the way the Federation came um, about addressing that issue was to invite parents to practices, just at least to see the interaction between the players and the coach and that nothing inappropriate was happening. So I think mm -hmm. we, you know, m many of these Muslim countries are up against that too, is that the best coach is oftentimes a male because there hasn't been infrastructure to develop a female coach through the system. But I think the feder like at least in Afghanistan, there's been training of female coaches in order to down the road address that issue. But it is an issue today still at times. All right, oh my gosh, all right, many a hand, me too. <laughs> all right, we're gonna do this as uh, we often say World Bank style. We're gonna take um, three questions and this um, woman right here with the, take three um, questions. Again, if you can tell us um, your name, where you're from, and please keep it brief to a question so we can really try and get um, as many folks comments um, as Thank you for your excellent presentation. My name is Rogan, and I represent an amazing group of girls uh, in Tibet, in India, that have formed the first Tibet Women's Football Club, and they are inspired by people like you. Um, they've come up against almost every issue you've brought up, and so my question is, 
how do you see um, cultural and national identity working with or against uh, the fight for gender equality? Because they are not uh, represented by country. They, they are Tibetans, they don't have a country. So it's very difficult for them to find people that will play them because playing them recognizes that, that they are Tibetan. Um, so they, they play a lot of Indian teams right now, but um, they are at the same time making huge headway in terms of the Tibetan community and gender rights. So I'd love for your comments on that. Great, thanks. Tim? Thank you. Um, Tim Nurse for Making Sense. Um, I want to follow up on the question of coaching um, and, and also how we've been talking a lot about you know, work on the pitch, but also the whole concept of soccer is so universal that it's very effective outside of the, the soccer field as well. And so we've done a lot of work around life skills and using the whole metaphor of coaching and working on the field and how that can develop the soft skills necessary for employment. And what we find is that the coach is such a critical component in that we want to get away from trainers who are telling you to do something to the idea of a coach who will help you practice and develop skills and then be, quote, off the pitch during the game when you're out there on your job or in your employment. And so it's kind of a comment just how these, these um, concepts are really applicable outside of the, the soccer field as well and I think very appropriate for youth in general. But then also a question for Paul. In our work, we found that the soft skills that we're developing for these life skill programs are very effective in general, but in particular for more informal jobs around entrepreneurship because of the multitasking aspect. And so just curious, in your work, are you finding that the impact is greater for self-employment in the informal economy or for formal employment? Great question. We're going to take um, one more in this round. Um, my friend right here with her hand up. Hi, my name is Lauren Key. I'm interning for RTI International. Um, as a female soccer player, I found as I was growing up that having like female role models, not even who are coaches, just older players was really helpful um, just for inspiration. And I was wondering if um, either of your programs um, had like a mentorship program with um, possibly like a graduate of your program coming back and saying, oh look, like I got a job and this is all due to the confidence I gained from this program just to inspire the girls. Um, just wondering if you had any aspect of that. Great, so three good questions, um, and we'll give you a chance to answer one or all of them. Paul, I'm going to come to you first, because you're on my right, and turn to Tim had a okay. specific so question for you. So on life skills, um, our numbers on entrepreneurship are really small compared to getting a job or going back to school. And I think it's because we've been focused mostly in urban areas, and our training has been mostly focused on learning a, a skill for a formal job. Yeah, but I totally agree with you that those same skills, teamwork, communication, a focus on results are tremendous entrepreneurial skills. And I think we have some more rural programs that have a higher emphasis on entrepreneurship, and, but we're not seeing that, that the skills are any better or any worse, that they're, they, they're universally good, however we use them. And to what you said about this, uh, we had a program in Brazil called Vencedoras. It was specifically for girls, and one of the most powerful things that happened was that girls who went through the program, a number of them served as interns, and when girls would call in and say, can I apply and tell me about this program, and when a girl answered the phone and said, I went through the program, you could just feel the tension leave uh, the, the young girl who's calling in, and you know they're saying, yes, you can do it. I, I did it, and here I am. And, and you know, I'll come talk to your mom or whatever. And it, it's, you're absolutely right that those examples of other young people are, make a huge difference. Um, Alyssa, any thoughts on sort of cultural national identity and or sort of the mentoring aspects of the program? Um, at least the mentoring aspect, I think what really helped um, in Afghanistan was the media and really um, them being able to showcase female athletes. Mm -hmm. And I noticed some, and these are very anecdotal stories, but you know, and I would see sometimes where girls um, would show up to the practices we were holding with the Federation and would recognize some of the other national team players because they were featured on TV. So I think the media can really play a huge factor in that in countries um, that are developing new, new programs. Um, in terms of the cultural and national identity, I'd love to talk to you more maybe, you know, off, offline, um, but just, I'd, I just have a few questions um, in terms of being able to answer that. I, I lived in India actually for three years. I was working for Seeds of Peace um, and still am as the director of South Asia programs. So I know that that, you know, the Tibet issue is always really um, a, a very sensitive 
the topic, so I'm not really well versed to be able to answer it, you know, the 30 now and then to have it go on, <laughs> on record. Um, but yeah, I'd love to ask you a few more questions, maybe talk a bit later with you. Brian, any thoughts of mentoring um, mm. older, younger players? Well, in, in, I wanted to uh, kind of speak to her question. Oh, yeah, um, like I said earlier, our national team, even though we had won a World Cup championship, we still had to go to the table and negotiate with the Federation on getting somewhere close to equality of what the men's um, team had, even though we had already won a World Cup championship. And even though both teams or the Federation was receiving USOC grant money that is supposed to be used equally, we still had to fight for that stuff. Now, granted, we didn't have you know our lives literally at stake, although you could say that our financial livelihood was in fact at stake because there was a time when you know we got five dollars per day per diem, and the men got thirty-five to forty dollars per day, and we had to somehow go to the table and explain how yes, we in fact also should have thirty-five dollars <laughs> if you don't mind, and it was it seemed at the time very irrational mm -hmm. that we would even have to try to fight for two massage therapists. You know, and these types of things. Now, like I said, we never had to fight for our, for our lives, but you're fighting the good fight. What, what you're doing is providing an opportunity, and you're going to have humongous obstacles to overcome. It's, but if, if your heart is in the right place, which it seems to be with the program you're doing, I don't understand necessarily or know or even proclaim to know the political or national implications of, of what you're trying to do and how that affects the girls and, and you. But it seems that every time you have to, to begin something that changes, there's gonna be that friction and there's gonna be that resistance and there's gonna be literally you know, people that think it's ridiculous what you're doing. And it's, as long as you think it's, it's good and can find a way and have people who maybe have come through to help you figure out how to go and, and to guide you, then you'll get there eventually. And if, if, if not you, then somebody behind you will. So keep up, keep it up. I'm gonna take two more quickly on the woman right here. Again, if we can just keep it brief. Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Nicole, thank you so much for the youth event and launching the youth initiative. And thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on uh, uh, young people and uh, women in, here locally here in DC, but I'm initially from Kenya. Then um, my question is, uh, how do you look at, uh, um, first uh, I was part of President Obama initiative. I did the review for the young people. It was a great review, but something funny, we never had sports and entertainment, uh, sports uh, looking at soccer. How do you look at the young people, especially young girls and boys who are with disability, like Tef? My son is Tef, and he's a very good soccer player. We have young girls in Kenya who are, who are Tef, but they are very wonderful soccer players. How do you include them into these programs of uh, soccer and while they are good players, and how do we work with you uh, in this uh, effect of soccer? Uh, the other thing, when is the next uh, women uh, uh, soccer, uh, World Cup soccer, so that we can all attend again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, one more. Suzanne, right there on the left. Thank you all so much. And um, just a quick note, Brianna, you said that uh, success is inspiration. Um, you've inspired me and many others, and you continue, so thank you for that. Um, Huge supporter of women's soccer, season ticket holder, the Washington Spirit. They could use more fans. Nice. Um, Thank you. Quick question about the coaching program. I wonder if, so I'm Suzanne Petroni. I'm with the International Center for Research on Women. I wonder if you specifically tackle gender norms in the curricula for coaches and facilitators. It seems that there's a tremendous opportunity, particularly given the, the gender um, challenges in both Central America and Afghanistan. Um, we at ICRW have a program in India that specifically works with coaches as mentors to change gender norms in cricket in India. Be happy to share some of that with you. Would love to hear more. Great. All right, we're gonna take those two. 
on um, gender norms in coaching, and if you have any thoughts on that, and also on any um, thoughts on how to um, include um, youth with disabilities in sports programs. I'll take the gender okay. norm question. Yeah. Um, I think for us, yes, we do address issues of gender, and we talk a lot with our facilitators about, first of all, establishing a safe and, and equal place, uh, trying to recognize where boys come from and where girls come from, um, and having a respectful environment while we're, while we're there. Um, I think we can approve it. Uh, as, we t as you asked the question, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, we, we could probably go a lot deeper into it. We, we have a five-day training of trainers, and it's packed. And people are always complaining that you know, we go from 8 in the morning to about 8 at night, and they're worn out, and we need to. So I'm not sure how we do that any longer without spending a whole lot more money. Um, but but it's, it's really important, and, and our activities are important. So again, I go back to holding hands with your teammate and what you learn and, uh, or playing a game with no rules or we talk to our facilitators about how you need, to, we give them the flexibility to change the rules as the game goes along, as the game goes along in order to balance the field. So that if boys aren't passing the balls to girls, then put a rule in that you, have, you can't pass it from a boy to a boy, or the next goal has to be scored by a girl, or, a, or only a pair that's holding a boy-girl pair or a girl-girl pair that's holding hands can score a goal. Force this. But it's not always the boys. It's sometimes the girls who need to speak up, and we have, they need to learn that they have the right and the confidence to claim their space. And so it's the, our, our trainers, facilitators need to work within those subtleties. Um, I mean, in terms of disability, I think in sport, I think um, unfortunately sometimes when you have a country that's still in the development stage, it becomes a very um, secondary point of focus for a federation when you're first working with the men's team and then maybe have a women's division. I think that the needs are very different. They're drastically different sometimes and the resources might not be there to really support it properly. So I think I've, I've seen not as much support in, in that realm, you know, in the countries that I've worked in at least. So I, I really can't, I, I can't speak to like what's been done in some others to really develop it, but at least that's what I've seen within the countries that I work in. Because when you are, when you have a Olympic athlete or a Paralympic athlete who um, may, may or may not be elite, I mean, they just require different equipment that might cost thousands of dollars that a federation can't really support. Um, I mean, in terms of just the question about gender and coaches, I know, um, I don't think there's a really considered effort from what I've seen in like in Afghanistan to really address that specifically. What I can speak to is I know uh, Magic Bus, for example, a friend of mine has done a lot of work with them, um, and I'm happy to put you in touch with him, but he's done efforts, like made efforts to really change the rules towards being able to address it. So one thing that he told me about that he's done with um, Magic Bus in India is have like a magic minute with soccer, is that boys weren't passing to the girls, they were playing mixed, and so what they do, um, they did is institute a new rule that said there's a magic minute, you don't know when it is during this game, but if a girl scores, your goal is actually worth three versus one. If a boy scores, it's worth one. But it's, and then they were just seeing exponentially that girls were, being, were having access to the ball a lot more because the boys were like, we have no idea when the minute's gonna be, but we can get three extra, like two extra points. So I think there's ways of doing that, you know, and obviously not at the elite level when you can't change FIFA's rules, but when you have youth programs to really help address that. And I'm happy to put you in touch with him because he does a lot of great work um, in terms of really changing and adapting rules to address certain issues. Great, one, uh, I'm sorry, Brianna, go ahead. Um, just addressing gender equality in soccer with, with, with coaching, I could probably say maybe at least half of the players that have come through on the national team, either assisted coach or, assisted coach or head coach of a major collegiate soccer team in this country. You know, Carla Overbeck um, is the assistant coach at Duke. Um, April Heinrichs came through the national team. She was a head coach at Maryland and University of Virginia. Uh, Jill Ellis, who is now the head coach of the U.S. national team, was the, na was the coach of UCLA. And there are several other players that have either come through the college ranks and played at a really high level or were in the national team pool or played on the national team that now became coaches. So these things take time, but it does, it does happen. You need to be able to train you know, the, these women to, to understand the game of soccer, but then also to be able to relate to students. Another great example is um, Karen Gabera, 
Um, she is the head coach at, at Navy and has been for, I think, 13 or 14 years now. And she came up through the national team and has been coaching you know, at that university for a very long time. And her role is multifaceted, right? Because she's training you know, kids to go on to military careers and trains them as individuals and at, you know, as, a, as an athlete and also as, a, as a someone who you know, fights for freedom. And uh, you know, she does incredibly well there. So I mean, it, it can happen and it is happening. Um, there's several examples of female coaches in the college ranks. Uh, it's, it's beginning to, to really start to impact and, and it is happening. One other um, comment just on the um, disabled that I, small scale kind of more community level examples um, are where uh, differently abled um, participants are brought into um, non sort of player roles but as part of the team or whether it's as a manager or are, are brought into a program to kind of support the team another way and sort of grow with the team and participate in some of the other aspects off the field so to speak that, that they do as a team. So I've seen that work um, in, in, in some at the community and, and local level. Um, but with that, I hope you'll please join me in thanking Paul, Brianna, and Arissa. Um, as well as for Drake for his uh, thoughtful comments and all of you for your great questions. Thanks for joining us today. We'll look forward to seeing you again at another event soon. Go Team USA or uh, wherever or it is from that you hail. <laughs> um, and um, if you are watching the 4 o'clock games and you decide to go across the street, you may um, see myself or, or some of your other uh, fellow attendees. So good luck. Thanks again. <laughs>